Welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Rowena Ichon. Our PRI All-Stars are back with a post-election wrap-up. To break it all down is Tim Anaya, Senior Director of Communications, Carrie Jackson, Fellow in California Reform, and Evan Harris, Manager of Media Relations and Outreach. We'll see who got it right, who got it wrong, and what it all means. Thanks for joining us. We're here taping the day after the election with a lot of votes remaining to be counted over the next few days and weeks. What's your major takeaway from the election? So let's go around the virtual table. Tim, you want to start? Well, my takeaway was it wasn't a good night for socialism. You know, you saw AOC and some of the other squad members campaigning heavily in Texas and Florida on things like Medicare for all and the Green New Deal. And you saw going into Election Day that Democrats were feeling very bullish about these states with uh, who also had high Latino populations going into Election Day. And then something remarkable happened. You know, voters who lived under socialism in Central and South America and who fled to the United States for their chance at the American dream rejected Democrats up and down the ballot because of their embrace of these socialist policies. So you saw in Texas that Trump won a surprisingly strong victory and Democrats failed to make any gains in the House of Representatives races. And in Florida, uh, according to the exit polls, Trump won 55 percent of the Cuban vote, 30 percent of Puerto Ricans and 48 percent of, quote unquote, other Latinos. And he increased his vote in Miami-Dade County by 200,000 votes over 2016. And most surprisingly, Republicans gained two House seats there. So even though Biden may ultimately win the election, I think the far left really overplayed their hand in many of these key states and turned off voters who, by all accounts, should have been in their column. How about you, Kerry? It's the same lesson that I think we we took in, um, but maybe some people didn't learn from 2016, is that don't trust the polls. Don't trust the legacy media. They, they are narrative driven. Even the pollsters, it seems like, with the numbers they were coming out with are narrative driven. Obviously, the legacy media is. And I, I, I don't want to say this, but I think I'm going to have to. I think you're going to, we're going to start putting Fox in this category of legacy media with the things that there was Chris Wallace at the first debate. Uh, they had somebody on calling last night, calling, uh, you know, doing the calling the state that I believe was a Democratic operative or somebody who's given money, uh, large sums of money to Democrats. So things seem to be changing in a sense there. So, but I have seen so much today as we did in 2016, the media saying, well, we just didn't quite get it right. We don't understand half of the country and the polls are quite clearly way, way off. There's a few that, have, that you can trust. But it helped contribute to this mess. And I, you know, as somebody said, and this is a bit of an aside, not directly related to the question, but given how much the media was carrying Biden's water, the Democratic Party's water, how much they were essentially operatives for the party, as Glenn Reynolds says, uh, I think he calls them Democratic operatives with bylines, that the race was close and still undecided at this point. And it, it is just, it is almost after seeing this stuff for so many decades of watching it, it's still amazing uh, how much they are the the house organ for the Democratic Party. And going back to my experience learning about journalism in college, journalism classes, most of these papers in this country, as I recall, started out as as organs for the party, whatever party or whatever political persuasion. And that's they were newsletters, and then they turned into newspapers. And well, now we're objective, but you know they're not objective. So that's that's my little 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 horse to ride this morning, this afternoon. Evan, how about you? I think I was stuck between um, two real big takeaways. I think one mirrors what Tim said was, um, you know, the the blue wave, you know, it's funny, you you heard all these color terminologies. If you watched the election coverage, it was a a blue wave and there'd be a red mist from a a spike in in GOP voters. Then it would go back to blue. I think just some of the key races, how quickly they were called for Republicans. And and I'll get into those some of my later answers, but your, um, your McConnell, your, your Lindsey Graham, um, 
I mean, some of the Florida, some of these races very early and, and Fox called them early and it seems like they're correct, but very early they were, they were called for the GOP or, or Republican candidates. And it seemed like it just took a lot of steam out of um, what Kerry said, this narrative of, of a blue wave of, of progressive politics taking everything over. Um, I, I think the polls actually toward the end, they did get closer. Um, I just think this idea that <clears throat> everything was going to be washed away. Senate, I said this, I was wrong. Senate would be a uh, Democrat. Um, the house would, would get even more members. I mean, it, it didn't really happen. And, and just the biggest takeaway that I was stunned about was just how quickly and, and right away some of these races were called very early in it. In it, you know, we'll get into it, but you know, Biden seems like he's in good shape and, and votes are still being counted. But um, it seems like it just took a lot of energy out of the campaigning and the narrative being set. And I, I was surprised to see that. I, I didn't think, you know, I thought maybe we'd be finding out about races now and, and just some of these races where, you know, a lot of money was spent. Um, it, it just, it didn't really happen. It kind of went back to um, the status quo and, and the voters on the ground and that, that narrative just, just didn't catch on. Well, you know, my major takeaway is that President Trump, if it wasn't, if he just comported himself like the usual annoying politician, he could have had this re-election in the bag, even with the coronavirus. Uh, many people, even the most ardent conservatives, were really struggling with his personality. Uh, it's clear that many just couldn't take it anymore. So look, that you know, the Senate is likely is likely to stay in GOP's hands. The House gained, uh, my, my count, I think five, seven seats so far. So the issue is not about policies, it's about him. And I really think that uh, we could have been even looking at a red wave if Trump just toned things down even halfway. So I think the story of, of this election is, is Trump himself. So as of this recording, we don't have a winner for president yet, but it looks like the Republicans have managed to hold on to the Senate. And as Ro just mentioned, they're gaining seats in the House. So what does this say about the electorate? Talk about uh, some of these changes in Congress that could impact a key California issue at the federal issue that you're watching. Let's start with Kerry. Well, that's the first question about what does it say about the electorate? And I think I said something along the lines of this in our last podcast, the, the pre-election podcast. And I think voters in this country tend to like split government. They don't want one party, generally speaking, controlling both the, uh, the White House and both chambers of Congress. And I, I think we saw that, you know, that's, that's a manifestation of that again uh, yesterday, last night's election and, and the county would uh, I, as far as California, the effect on California, I, I'm strained mightily to see how this might change things in California. Uh, I and I'm I'm being willing to have my colleagues to uh, to school me on this. I hope somebody does. I just don't see a whole lot of change. Uh, if Biden is eventually declared the winner, president, yeah, he'll be in more line with California politics than Trump was, and I guess the resist signs that I've seen all over the place will eventually be taken down. But again, with, with the, the, the House remaining, uh, not changing, but actually picking up some Republican seats, uh, the Senate remaining in Republican hands, uh, I just don't see a whole lot changing between Washington and uh, uh, California, any relationship there. Now, I last I looked, California lost a few, a little less than a handful. I, I don't know what the most recent numbers are, but it was looking like we would lose a, a handful of uh, of seats in Congress turning over from Democrat Republican. And I, I hope somebody's got the newer information than, than I do on that one. But again, uh, I think things out here are just kind of going to keep uh, moving along as they have without any kind of blip in the road or bump in the road, rather. And remember, on those numbers for the seats in Congress, you know, we've probably got about four to five million more votes that still needs to be tabulated. Uh, in California over the next few weeks. So it's premature at this point, but you're right. As of now, there's a few seats that are, uh, that are switching hands. Evan, what do you think? Um, th this really fits into my previous answer of, I, I don't know if the, the narrative of, of so much changing, I just don't, it didn't really happen. Um, 
I was looking at some races across the country and a, a lot of uh, congressional members, house members that, that won in 2018 with, with this blue wave that, um, you know, took over Congress, you know, some of them lost. And that was a lot of this surprise of, of Democrats in the house underperforming um, some names I pulled up that, that were interesting and watched races were uh, Stephanie Bice in Oklahoma uh, she won against a 2018 candidate, a Dem candidate who won. Um, some other ones were Nancy Mace in South Carolina's first district, uh, Yvette Harrell in New Mexico, um, Florida, uh, South Florida defended and in, in is potentially is going to add seats to the House, which um, nobody expected. And I think that fits, fits into the Florida narrative of these people have their they had their stuff together on election night and the race was called early. Um, I, I just see it as the electorate, you know, so much was pushed this year of, of the progressive politics of everything happening in the country. Um, I don't know if the electorate rejected it, you know, that Dems still have the house Senate looks like Republican. Uh, we don't know about the presidency, but, um, you know, the electorate is, is not cut and dry and you can't, you can't apply these broad sweeping messages. Um, you know, a Florida, uh, went heavily for Trump in the GOP. Um, right now it looks like Arizona is going to Biden. Um, so you can't, you can't just pick and choose these voter blocks and think the same messaging or the, th or the same tones are going to work. And that's, that's what it felt like going into this. That's what it felt like for kind of this whole year. And, and nobody, you know, some of the polls, they tightened up, but nobody really saw that. Um, for an issue that could impact California, uh, it was Kelly, Kelly Loeffler won her, her Senate seat in Georgia. So she'll, I believe she makes it to a runoff. Um, but she actually had introduced a bill in the summer that I had to do, Pierre, I talked about this, we had to do with um, big tech and, and moderating content. And so she kind of introduced this far reaching bill that you know, if she makes the runoff and stays, it could have a lot of implications for Silicon Valley, for your Facebooks and Twitters. And it, and it has to do with um, moderating content. It would, it would basically force social media companies to have this kind of a more strict um, and one could say a more fair guideline for how they enforce content. And, you know, some of that, some of that came out last night um, when Trump started talking, when he started tweeting, I was literally watching different um, capital reporters and, and some Sacramento reporters arguing about the way Twitter and Facebook were reacting to the president's um, tweets and to his message. And were they flagging it? Were they making it clear to voters that the election hadn't been called? And, and there was, you know, it, it kind of took over social media for a while and I, I fell asleep. So I don't know what happened, but um, Loeffler and a few other senators, I think are pushing these bills. Obviously there's an antitrust lawsuit, but um, that's a big one that, you know, it'll impact Silicon Valley, it'll impact California. Uh, beyond that, um, I think Kerry's right. I, I just don't know if, if too much has changed, even with a, a switch in the presidency. I, I, I think we're kind of almost back to where we started, which is depressing to say, but um, I, I think it's largely a, a, almost a stalemate. Well, you know, what I think it says about the electorate, what this election says about the electorate is that nationally and especially in California, the electorate is more moderate than what the media and, and pollsters would, would have us believe uh, because the GOP looks like it's gonna hold the Senate, um, even gain members in the House. Uh, you know, California will continue to get its hand slapped when it tries to reach dollar, reach for dollars in, in Washington. Uh, I think you can be certain that stimulus dollars will be curtailed, uh, salt deduction limits uh, will stay in place. Uh, the Trump tax cuts that helped out uh, high tax Californians, uh, not likely to be repealed. Uh, it's also less likely that California can export its bad policies like uh, AB5, you know, our climate change policies, and not to mention, you know, all the social justice ideas so loved by AOC and, and the far left of the party. So I, I think it's, it's a big deal that uh, the Senate's going to be retained by Republicans. I agree with you, Ro. There's going to be no Green New Deal, no court packing, no Medicare for all, no $4 trillion Biden tax increase if he wins and 
uh, no universal basic income. And I agree with Carrie too. I think um, yesterday shows that voters do like checks and balances. So looking at the results, who is your vote for the election's biggest winner and the biggest loser? Go for it, Tim. Well, I don't uh, mean to toot my own horn, but I will. As I predicted on our election preview podcast, don't ever bet against Cocaine Mitch. He emerged as the big winner of uh, election 2020. You know, first in Kentucky, the Democrats poured $100 million against him to support Amy McGrath, and she lost by 21 points. So on a personal level, there was that. And then the Democrats were so bullish about taking back the Senate, and they spent all these hundreds of millions of dollars in these races that they had no chance of winning. And now, uh, as of this time, they've only gained one seat in the Senate in Arizona. They, they lost in Texas. They lost in Iowa. It looks like they've lost in North Carolina and at least one seat in Georgia. Uh, they lost in Maine. Um, you know, and, and Michigan is back and forth. So, you know, that uh, we leave this election with Cocaine Mitch staying as likely as majority leader. To me, I mean, if that's not the big winner, I don't know who is. Honorable mention goes to my old boss, Kevin McCarthy, who defied all the odds and ended up gaining seats in the House. And it looks like at the end of the day, there's just going to be a handful of seats difference between Democrats and Republicans in the House. No one thought that was possible going into Election Day. And that's really going to complicate um, even Nancy Pelosi's efforts to get some of these big ticket liberal items, even through the House. The biggest loser is state Senate Republican leader Shannon Grove. Going into the election, she only had 11 seats out of 40 in her caucus. And right now, Republicans have lost two seats in the Senate. And in two others, it's just hundreds of votes in one open Republican seat. The Democrat leads by a few hundred votes in another seat held by a Republican incumbent going for reelection. He's ahead by just a few hundred votes. And both of those on too, depending on how late absentee votes go. So Republicans could have as few as seven seats in the state Senate come December. And however you look at it, that's an epic failure, a disaster for Senator Grove. Go ahead, Evan. Um, Tim, Tim had the right answer for the biggest winner. And, and that's what I put was Mitch McConnell. And I did bet against Mitch McConnell and I shouldn't have, but, um, you know, I, I said this in my earlier answers. Um, he, his race was called early and I don't think there was much doubt he was going to win. Although, you know, the media played it up, but, um, just the fact that the Senate is coming back, um, I think of Graham's race. I, I think of um, Tillis. I think of Collins. Um, you know, and, and let's not forget they brought in a new Supreme Court judge, which everyone thought was the end of some of them uh, a month ago, less than a month ago. So the fact that that he won and he's he's as of now still the uh, majority leader is something. And in a, a stat I had to kind of hit home at at Tim's point of the money spent, Amy McGrath and Jamie Harrison. They raised a combined $199 million over the course of the election. They lost to Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham by a combined 35 points. And that, that's just, that's almost the Beto O'Rourke territory of raising an, an absurd amount of money and, and just not coming anywhere close to even challenging for a result. It's not like, you know, we're still waiting to find out. It, it was, those were some of the first races called. So, um, I think, you know, Senate Republicans and Congress have it together. My biggest loser, I'm actually going to change my answer. I, I had the polling industry and I, I think that's obvious, but I actually think my biggest loser to me is if Joe Biden in that, even if he wins and he's in, I just don't think again, like Democrats are that optimistic about the way this election went. And I think it was the focus on things were so high Biden, I mean, we're waiting to call it, you know, it could be going his way. It could not be. But the fact that he was allegedly ahead by so much, he was, you know, coming into it days before he was five to 7% ahead. Um, it's amazing to me that he is limping in with, you know, look at how much money they spend. Look at, you know, 
Trump was the only candidate who did not give any of his own money to his own campaign. And that's never happened. Um, being outspent in the last quarter, fundraising in the last quarter. I mean, you, you go down the list. Um, I think it just shows maybe his underwhelming nature. The fact that he limped in, I, you know, that's going to be debated for a long time, but I think just the, the air and the confidence that folks came into election day with, um, it was a very nervous night last night and, and, you know, they could still win the presidency, but it doesn't seem like it was going to be the victory they wanted. And that seems to have taken out a lot of this momentum and belief that everyone was going to go along with this agenda and this and the Biden ideas and all that. And I, it's just, it's just not there. And that's, that's got to hit for something knowing that you, you barely squeak by in these States. If, if the numbers hold. I feel like the kid who was left standing with no chair to sit in when the music stopped playing after these two answers from Tim and Evan, I, I just I scorched the earth uh, for me. Um, I t- uh, Evan mentioned polling. Pollsters, yeah, that, they're, they're big losers. He also mentioned, without a lot of detail, but we talked about pollsters too, uh, quickly mentioned Lindsey Graham. Uh, i say he's a huge winner. Uh, Donna Shalala was a big loser. And that one struck me as being – that was a surprise. I didn't, I didn't think she was going to, uh, to lose her place, but to lose her seat, but she did. In, in some ways, I, I want to say the, the voting public – or not even the voting, but just the entire country is, is lost a little bit, uh, given the disservice from the pollsters and from the media. Uh, I, 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 and we may be given a president and a, a vice president who, whose power will certainly be limited. Uh, with the uh, the split in Congress, but you know Biden worked for the uh, pen and phone president, and we'll see what he's going to do if, if he indeed ends up in the White House. What he's going to do with executive orders, and uh, there are quite a few, I think, especially when he's undoing deregulation that's going to make losers out of a lot of people in this country, small businesses, the uh, uh, middle class generally, uh, energy industry for sure. And and I think those of us who prefer a limited government and understand why it's important and, and, and you know, are always fighting for expanded liberty, greater liberty, I think they're going to be, we're going to be losing some too. Not in great numbers that maybe we feared, but I, I think there's, there's some small step backwards, steps backward there. Well, I went for the two obvious choices, and I, I agree with everybody here. Um for me, the pollsters uh, were the biggest losers. I didn't think they would actually get it wrong again over predicting a blue wave. You know, I thought that they had made all of these so-called adjustments from the last, the last election. Apparently they didn't. But uh, in fact, I think it's even worse this time around. For example, I, I saw this uh, ABC Washington Post uh, poll the other day that had uh, Wisconsin head by 17 points. Uh, and uh, now, as we know, it's, it's they're, they're uh, going to ask for a recount. So uh, the pollsters, I've got to believe it was just pulling malpractice. And I'm not sure if I will ever believe a, a political poll again. My biggest winner, of course, I agree with everyone here, is uh, Mitch McConnell. Uh, time and again, uh, when the rubber meets the road, he delivers for the party, whether it's uh, Supreme Court justices, carrying the ball in legislation, holding the line on spending, uh, retaining a majority in the Senate. You know, I think he will go down as a historic figure in American conservative politics. So turning to California, there were several statewide and local ballot measures on Tuesday's ballot. And in some cases, the results were predictable. But in others, the voters made some surprising choices. So what's one ballot measure result from Tuesday that caught your eye and what are the policy implications of those results? Let's start with Evan. Well, I feel like I'm going to take everybody's answer, but um, it's got to be Prop 22 and uh, the initiative pushed by Uber and Lyft. It would create a basically another classification for their employees and basically undo um, AB five. And that's, that's a very layman's, uh, understanding of it. But, um, again, I think it fits with the theme that I, that I noticed and, and, and my opinion of the night was, you know, after eight, once, once the secretary of state's website had loaded the results for California, I mean, prop 22 was up early and it, it was called very quickly and the opponents 
realize that. And they, you know, they were tweeting and they were, they were sending out um, stuff about, you know, we got beat and we'll be back again and, and this and that. But I mean, the, the speed that it was rejected in, in a blue state like California, um, it, it was interesting. I, I didn't expect to see that. I, you know, they put a lot of money into it. I think it was close to 200 million and that might be lowballing it. But um, the fact that it was, you know, labeled as big, big business versus unions, um, you know, unions win in California. I think we all know that that's, that's not, um, that's not an opinion. That's just kind of more of a fact here. But um, again, the speed in just how quickly um, folks had voted against it and it was called um, surprise me. Ro, how about you? Well, you know, the propositions that caught my eye, a number of them were the ones that had to do with business in California. And we've written, you know, again and again and right by the bay that California is one of the worst places to do business, if not the worst place to do business in the country. So consider that um, for Prop 22, as Evan mentioned, uh, the app-based business proposition, Uber and Lyft spent over $200 million dollars. Uh, for Prop 23, which I've written about, um, it's um, mandating doctors in dialysis clinics, uh, the opposition had to spend $105 million. And for Prop 15, and that's a split role, which would um, allow taxes to be raised for commercial property, $60 million was spent for that. So being in the bullseye of California's initiative process is just one more reason why California can, can, continues to chase businesses away from the state. Kerry, what say you? I'm going with Prop 21. Uh, not so much. This is a quick description. It would have allowed local governments under certain conditions to enact rent control laws. Um, not so much that it, that it lost, but the way it lost. It was defeated soundly. Last uh, numbers I saw, and you guys may have some more updated if you do let me know, but it was about a 60 40 split uh, against this thing. Uh, that I find that to be a powerful rebuke. Uh, I would not have been actually surprised if it had won narrowly, but when when you're looking at these kind of numbers, uh, you know, that, that's you can't ignore that, not at all. Uh, unfortunately, it's being defeated it isn't going to help California's festering housing crisis, but at least it didn't pass and and you know, be an element that's going to make it worse down the road. Uh, you know, this this uh, California needs as much help or help itself as much as possible. This housing crisis, and this was not help. So, yeah, uh, you know, again, the the margin by which it looks like it's going to lose is is uh, quite a statement. Well, I was surprised by the results over Prop 25, which our listeners may remember was a referendum on a law that was enacted a couple of years back to end cash bail in California. Now, in the wake of the George Floyd incident and all the mass protests this summer. You know, conditions were really ripe for voters to give their OK to ending cash bail. And that was especially true since California had a temporary zero cash bail policy in place for much of the COVID-19 pandemic this spring. But voters soundly rejected Prop 25 with 55 percent voting no. And so the big question is, what were voters saying? Did they think that what the legislature enacted in SB 10 didn't go far enough. You know, many far left groups actually oppose oppose Prop 25 for that reason. So now the action turns to the legislature and it'll be interesting to see, you know, will they go back to the drawing board and perhaps come up with a, a, a bail quote reform measure that's more liberal or will they throw their hands up and say the voters have spoken? Time will tell. I've got one for you, Tim. Gavin Newsom had a lot at stake in Tuesday's election results for balancing the state budget. How did things fare with for the governor? Did voters bail him out in his efforts to balance the state budget while preserving liberal big spending? Well, I would say Gavin Newsom has not really received the results that he desired uh, for his budget balancing efforts, although things may turn out okay. So first off, as we mentioned earlier, you know, voters, as of this taping, are rejecting Prop 15, the split role measure, by about 400,000 votes right now. And remember, um, as I mentioned earlier, Paul Mitchell, who's the the guru of political data in the state, um, says about 13 million, 13 and a half million votes have been um, cast so far. 
and the final vote count will be somewhere between 16 and 17 million votes. So we have a ways to go. But if that margin holds, that's about 11 million uh, billion dollars that Newsom was counting on, some of which to help him with his budget balancing efforts. And that would be out the window if Prop 15 ultimately fails. On the federal level, Newsom has strongly pushed for Speaker Pelosi's plan for a several hundred billion dollar bailout for the states. Well, regardless of whether Joe Biden wins, it's going to be much tougher to pass that even through the House because the Republicans are gaining seats there. And it's it very unlikely in a Republican Senate. Um, now, Senator McConnell says that he wants to pass another stimulus bill before the end of the year, but his version of stimulus looks very different than Speaker Pelosi's, and it certainly won't include a multi-billion dollar bailout for California. Now, there's one bit of good news, and that's that the Department of Finance projected that California's taken in $8.7 billion more than it projected from July through September. So that's going to make it easier for him as he tries to come up with a uh, a budget to announce in January. But however you look at it, he's got a big headache on his hands as he tries to uh, work on his budget plan for next year. And he may have to now prod the legislature into enacting some sort of tax hike next year. Uh, certainly massive spending cuts the legislature will find unacceptable. And, you know, Newsom, I think, would be wary to even propose those. So I'm going to return the favor, and I have a question for Ro. So it appears, and more than appears, the Associated Press has projected that voters have rejected Prop 16, which would have repealed Prop 209 and brought gender and racial preferences back to California. Now, proponents said they had a once-in-a-generation opportunity to go back to voters to try to repeal Prop 209. So do you think this is the last we're going to hear about this issue for a while, or will we see another big vote coming our way in 2022 or 2024? Tim, unfortunately, I think it will come back, uh, if not in this form, in another form. You might remember that uh, this is actually the third attempt to overturn Prop 209. There was a bill in 2011. Uh, it was vetoed by Jerry Brown. And then there was also SCA 5, Senate Constitutional Amendment 5, in 2012 that didn't make it to the ballot because of huge opposition from Asian Americans. You know, I, I think it will come back because this, this notion of equity is sweeping so many of our institutions from the academy to liberal elite politicians, to the workplace, even the boardroom. So, you know, we know that Californians and most people don't want racial preferences, but I think the liberal elites will find another way to try to make it happen and um, I'm sure this, uh, this is just one of many battles that we'll be fighting again and again. So Carrie, unions got a big black eye in California last night when Prop 22 was overwhelming, overwhelmingly approved by voters. Uh, so Carrie, you're our resident expert on AB5. What do you think the landslide victory for 22 means for the debate um, of AB5 in the upcoming session? Is there a new momentum to make a, a run at repealing the law? I think it would give it some new momentum. Yes, I, I believe somebody, either Tim or Evan, uh, used the word landslide on 22. Uh, and last, again, I'm looking at numbers that are probably a few hours old. 58% uh, voted for 22 to, as, you know, to stop at least AB5 from applying to uh, the app-based drivers at Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, that, those sort of places. I, AB5 might be both at the same time the worst and the most hated law passed in California in our lifetimes. It, 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 it is simply a miserable, wretched piece of legislation uh, that has affected so many lives in the wrong way. Uh, so, yeah, there's there's going to be some already support out there to get rid of this thing, to want to repeal it. Uh, and I don't think we're going too far to think that if, if you look at the numbers, again, uh, that um, from, the, uh, from yesterday uh, that the voters put down, I think you can probably say that that's a mandate for repeal. Uh, um, I, I, people might disagree with me, but you know, that's the way I'm looking at it at the moment. Um, I, I think part of it, too, is that a lot of Californians, wealthy Californians, didn't want to lose Uber and Lyft and the, the convenience that these 
and that they've gotten used to with these companies. And of course, Uber and Lyft said, you know, we might have to stop doing business in California because we just can't do it if we're going to force to have to employ the drivers as opposed to uh, having them as you know, as our customers, essentially, is what they are. The drivers are their customers using their apps. Um, but you know, I, I still think that the, the, the opposition to AB5, through looking at it through this lens, is just so hard and is unmistakable that we'll see some We'll see some activity coming up, and we know a few of our legislators ourselves who have been very active on uh, uh, against AB5. So we'll see what comes up in the next few months. So, Evan, voters appear to have turned down Prop 18, which would have let 17-year-olds vote in primary and special elections in California. Now, this seems like it would have been a no-brainer here in liberal California. How do you explain its defeat? Well, I don't. I don't know how. <laughs> um, I, I think you're right. I I was surprised this failed it when it when it came up and, and it came up early on the on the registrars after eight. It was it was already down. I think right now it's losing um, 44 to, to 55 percent against. So um, it's it's probably done. But I don't know. I, I looked around in the in the last podcast. I talked about Colorado um, had a had a measure that. Last year, Colorado passed a similar uh, law, and this year they had a measure to repeal that, and that passed in Colorado. So Colorado got rid of that, and and 17-year-olds that turn 18 in an election year now can't vote in Colorado. Um, and I looked elsewhere. There was a measure, or Prop G in San Francisco, which would have allowed 16-year-olds to vote, uh, did not pass either. So there seems to be this pushback um, whether folks think it should just be 18 and above that you should be allowed to vote. You know, obviously the constitution says that the U S constitution, but um, you know, not just California, San Francisco, which in exactly a conservative stronghold, Colorado, um, other places, you know, are saying no to this right now. So um, I'm, I'm not sure where it comes from. Maybe it's more generational, Maybe it's um, older folks thinking, you know, if you're if you're younger than 18, you shouldn't be allowed to vote yet. Um, I I was surprised and I was more surprised looking at the other states to see that um, across the board, these things are they being repealed or not or not passed. So I, I think it's going to be back. Um, I mean, it, it came from the legislature. You know, it wasn't being pushed by any group. Um, I, th- I think a lot of the the big groups in California um, whether union or ACLU types uh, said to support it. I, I don't know if anyone was really against it, but I think eventually it will pass. Um, I just, I don't know, just for this year, it seems like across the U S maybe where it was up, folks didn't like the idea right now and maybe they didn't understand it. But um, I think people see it as a gateway to we're eventually going to have like 14 year olds voting. And yeah, that's kind of a slippery slope and, and there needs to be a, a debate about that. So are there any races, state ballot measures around the country that you are watching closely that took you by surprise? So let's go around the virtual table. Let's let's start with Tim this time. Well, one race that surprised me was the race for uh, mayor of Stockton. Uh, You know, Michael Tubbs, who gained national prominence for his embrace of a universal basic income scheme, is actually trailing in his race for re-election as mayor, of course, with the caveat that there are thousands more late absentee ballots left to count. Now, he was being touted as a potential U.S. senator or statewide office holder, but perhaps the voters thought he should have paid more attention to crime and potholes than his future political ambitions. How about you, Evan? Uh, Mine's more collective, but, you know, we had predicted um, California state assembly, state senate races, and I, I think, as Tim mentioned, you know, the state senate, unfortunately, held up to their uh, bargain of, or their, um, what we thought, and they lost seats. But I was surprised across the board, we talked about potentially there could be gains in the House um, as of voting right now. Um, and, and the State Assembly too, it, 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 things didn't really move that much. And I, I think that was a surprise to see. You figure, again, here in California, you think, gosh, everything's just going to keep moving a little bit further to the left. And um, that, that really didn't happen 
You you even had Chad Mays who ran as an MPP, um, an independent. Um, he won pretty pretty handily and and has a good lead. And I I think that race is done. But I think again this this idea, this progressive, this this movement. Um, it it didn't. I don't know if it didn't connect with voters, but especially on on the left coast, um, it it didn't quite happen here. Sure, Republicans are outnumbered by a lot. Um, you know, there weren't any challenges to any state um, statewide office holders, anything like that. But um, you always think it's going to be pushed to the edge, and there'll be less and less um, conservative folks, and and that that just didn't really happen. Um, so my other runner up um, was was Florida. And and I think the big surprise was, again, how early it was called, but, you know, Trump won by 400,000 votes, which, you know, I'm sure we all thought we'd be de- we'd be debating Florida right now and they'd still be counting. But it, it was called so early. Um, I think it just fit with the narrative of, of the evening. Go ahead, Kerry. I was a little surprised that North Carolina and Georgia well, Biden showing in those states. I, I thought he would certainly Georgia, being my native state. I still keep up somewhat, and I was uh, not shocking, of course, not terribly surprised, but mildly surprised that uh, the Biden did as well. And, and, and last time I looked, again, I'm, I'm looking at information. Or last time I saw information was a few hours old. It was they were still, according to some, still in play. The, the numbers indicated to me that they weren't that that uh, they were going to be red states. But uh, yeah, again, the fact that for in in any circumstances that we've waited this long or somebody's waited this long to call those states for Trump has uh, surprised me. I'm, I, the other one I was watching, I don't say I was watching closely or be surprised by it, but I, do, I was paying attention to Maxine Waters. I find he found to be a very credible uh, and I, I thought a good candidate. I didn't have any illusions that he was going to beat her at all, but I thought he would have given her a little more, of a run, but uh, that he didn't even come close at all. You know, he, he got smoked in that that election, and um, and I just wonder what it would ever take to get her to have her constituents to see she's not the best person for them. And uh, a man like Joe Collins, uh, you know, he's, like I say, very impressive candidate in my mind. Uh, you know, got nowhere. That's more of a frustration than a surprise, I suppose. Even though I don't live in that district. Well, I've been watching this race closely. Uh, it's one that probably no one here is watching, but it's a, it's a Honolulu City Council District 3. And I, I was watching that race because my ex-roommate at USC, Esther Kiaina, was running for city council. And it looks like she's going to be the winner. So for listeners who are not familiar with Hawaii District 3, it wraps around Kaneohe, Kailua, and Waimanalo. And in an island that's so beautiful, this area of Hawaii is really one of the most beautiful places on the island. So Esther uh, Kiaina served as Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, of Interior during the Obama administration. It's obviously a Democrat, but she see- received a lot of Republican support. Uh, Because of the coronavirus, Hawaii's economy has been devastated. It needs to diversify its economy outside of tourism. Her parents were small business owners, and I think she's going to be a champion of small business in the state. So good for Mm -hmm. Esther. So as we close, you know, we're conservatives, so we're big on accountability. Now, I patted myself on the back earlier for my prediction that Republicans will retain the Senate. And Kerry was equally prescient when he said, we won't know who will be the next president. So let's go around the table now and do a recount. As of this taping, who do you think will be the next president? Let's start with uh, Evan. Uh, I'll stick with Biden. I think the vote count's coming out now. I, Tim, you said, they, I think Michigan was called for him. I, the way the data is pointing, um, the remaining ballots are all in... Um, you know, they're near Detroit, they're near Atlanta, um, urban areas, Dem- Democrat leaning areas, uh, Democrat counties. So I, I think barring any major shocks, um, I'm sticking with Biden. Ro? I've got to go with Biden as well. Uh, President Tr- Trump's path seems very, very narrow now that uh, Biden has uh, it's been called for Wisconsin and Michigan. All he really needs to do is win Nevada. Um, He doesn't even need Michigan. So 
So I think it's still going to be Biden. Kerry? Uh, the short answer, I'm going to have to go even just to be different. I, I'm going to say I'm going to say it's going to end up Trump. He's going to keep his keep his White House or not his White House. He's going to keep the White House. Well, looking at how things are going as of this taping and who knows, we might know the winner by the time this post later this afternoon. But I think Biden gets to the 270 even without Pennsylvania. But when all is said and done, uh, depending on the goofiness and uh, in uh, Arizona and and and, uh, and all, you know, it could be 270 to 268, and that one electoral vote that Biden won in Nebraska could have made the difference and prevented uh, what really we all deserved being in 2020 a 269 to 269 tie. But I think uh, Joe Biden can start measuring the drapes. Bye 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 bye. 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 Thanks to Tim and I, Carrie Jackson, and Evan Harris. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and now iHeartRadio and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. From the PRI All-Stars, thanks for joining us.